Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. I'm David Bird with Reality Reimagine. I'm an award-winning photographer and Photoshop artist that specializes in fantasy composite art. And today we're gonna have episode 15 of the shop vlog, where I take an image from start to art and share the entire process with you. But today's episode, we're going to edit a gelled glamour image, specifically this image of my wonderful friend, Shirley Sue Risen. We have worked together for many years. She's an incredible talent and I absolutely adore or working with her and she's multi-talented she's a model she's an author she's just a great human being and when we do gel glamour shoots I tend to get a lot of great emotion a lot of great expression and storytelling from her so I'm excited to work on this image today and to share it with you for that reason but also because we're going to go through some of the standard paces and techniques that we would normally do with any image but since this is lit with gels there's a whole host of new opportunities for the retouching because because the entire image is told through varying colors that supports the story, so we can use those colors to drive things like color, luminosity, and detail, to drive the audience's focus, and to create different layers or different options within the edit that goes beyond just the standard norm when we are working with an image that is lit through traditional lighting or through the sun, and we may not have as many tools to work with. So it's gonna be an exciting adventure, and this is also one that you can work alongside with me. So if you look at the description below, you'll see a link to the Google Drive where you can download this image and work alongside to the entire tutorial today. Now, if you download the image and you create some artwork with it and you share it to social media, please make sure to tag Shirley Sue. These are the two social media links that you can use for Facebook and Instagram respectively. You do not need to tag me or Reality Reimagined at all. I do own the copyright for the image. However, I'm going to ask you on the honor system, please don't do anything inappropriate with this image. Please don't share it or sell it or edit anything that would take it beyond the realm of what it's meant to be. This is an opportunity for you to continue your education by working with this image alongside me so please respect that and honor that and just follow the program and the tutorial today so with that let's dive into the photoshops and begin episode 15 editing us some gel glamour beauty Let's begin by talking about the photography and everything that went into play to create this image before we dive into Adobe Camera Raw and begin the retouching process. This image was captured with four different lighting units that I purchased from a company called Luminate. These specific units are called Full Spectrum. They are full RGB controlled units that are wonderful to work with. However, the only drawback to them is the amount of lumens that they can produce or the amount of light that they can produce. Now, typically when I do gel photography, I use my Godox AD600 strobes, which can throw a lot of light and a lot of power. So that enables me to set my Canon EOS R to the settings that I prefer, which is F11, ISO 50 or 100, and a shutter speed of 1 1 60th of a second. That way I get some really dramatic lighting, some great shadows, and the colors can be manipulated a lot in Photoshop. But because the full spectrum units from Luminate can't throw that much light, equivalent to a strobe like a Godox AD600, I kind of had to change how I shot Gel Glamour. Now I like both styles, both settings for the cameras, and it's just kind of a question of what I'm feeling like for that shoot and what I want to do with it. So in the case of using the full spectrum units, I'm using my Canon EOS R. I'm also using my Canon EF 85 millimeter 1.4 prime lens. So I'm shooting at uh, ISO 100 and f-stop of 1.4. So completely wide open with that prime and then a shutter speed of 1 1 60th of a second. With the 1.4, I'm getting in as much light as possible and then I'm able to take down that ISO so we can keep the noise to a minimum. But that also means that I'm going to have to work with the luminosity values immediately to start increasing them. Whereas if I were using the Godox system, I would still work with luminosity values, but I don't have to push them as far as I will when I'm using the full spectrum units from Luminate. It's the same process, and it isn't really that big of a disparagement between those two processes, but it's one that does require a little bit of finesse and practice when I work with it. So. Principles and fundamentals of Photoshop that I've talked about in a lot of different videos is color, luminosity, and detail. Those are the three different fundamentals and cornerstones that give you an idea of where to begin and what to do with your image when you sit down in front of Adobe Camera Raw and say, okay, which sliders do I work with first? But instead of coming to the basic tab here, 
and working with things like exposure, shadows, whites, the black points, and even vibrance and saturation, since this is a gel glamour image, where I want to begin is to come down to the color mixer tab here. So the color mixer tab is changed and new as of Photoshop CC 2020, I believe. If you're using 2019 or a previous version, then you're going to see a tab that says HSL or Hue, Saturation, and Luminance. It won't say Color Mixer. And it will not look like this. It will look more like this interface if you're using an older version of Photoshop. It does the exact same thing, but in the new panel and new interface for Adobe Camera Raw, they gave you the option, one, they changed the name here to Color Mixer, and two, they gave you the option to have control all over the different functions of hue, saturation, and luminance all within the same screen under one color. In the old version, you had to choose one thing, so like I'm gonna choose the hue and move the varying colors, then if I wanted to change the saturation, I have to go to that tab and so forth. But under the new interface, I can just simply select a color and affect all three different values, hue, saturation, and luminance. So that's where I'm going to start. Now, in this scene, we can see that I'm using essentially a palette of blue and orange. The blue that is above her is getting us closer to the blue purples in the spectrum. The blue that I'm using down by her legs is getting us closer to the greens, so we're getting that blue teal. The orange that is on her right or camera left or document left, that one favored a little bit more of the red side of the spectrum. So that red orange and then the orange that is on camera right or her left side is getting us just a little bit closer to that orange yellow tone. I did that on purpose because I wanted just a little bit of confluence, conflux, somewhere that sounds like that, where we would get some nice mixtures of colors coming through the scene, again, in those same primary families of orange and blue, but just little subtle variations to the tones. And as they mix with the furniture, they mix with themselves, they're going to add some different spectrums of colors that can be a lot of fun to work with. So let's start with orange and simply see how much of it is in play in the scene. So my favorite thing to do just to see that is when I'm in, again, in the color mixer, I will just take the saturation all the way down. Now, as you can see, the saturation of orange is not completely fading orange everywhere. This is a part of the process of that color orange mixing with the blues, mixing with her skin tone, mixing with everything and producing some magentas and purples and so forth. This is the fun of retouching gelled images because there's so much to work with. So in this case, I know that the orange is you know, it's there definitely, but it's not the predominant color that we're going to see into the scene. So I feel more comfortable pushing up the saturation specifically just of orange. And to make this note really quickly for any beginners in Photoshop, the reason why I didn't want to start here with vibrance and saturation is this is a global increase of all the colors at once. The wonderful thing about using the color mixer is that you can control the individual colors and let some of those saturation points, even some of the luminance points or change the hue of them so that you can get more fine-tuned results. So in this case, I'm again increasing the saturation. I'm at like, let's say plus 21, sounds good to me. Let's increase the luminance too, just to see where that's gonna get us. I don't want it to make it too flat. We can definitely see the side of her face and her body where the orange is coming into play. So I don't think we need to increase it too much. Let's take it down and make it a little bit darker. No, I don't think that's necessary either. So just a little gentle boost of light and the oranges is fine. I'm at plus eight right now and I think that's good to go. And I don't really wanna change the hue of it because I like what I see. I mean, I could shift it just a little bit more toward the yellows to try to match this side if I wanted to. But ultimately, I think it's okay. I'm like, it's at plus 11, so I'm going to take it back to like plus 7 on the hue. So again, shifting that orange just a little bit closer to yellow and getting it away from that red. Now, let's go to the blues and have some fun there before we go to the reds and the purples and magentas and try to problem solve those if we need to. So under the blue channel, the main blues, let's go ahead and take the saturation down. You can see that there is a lot of blue in this scene, which blue is my favorite color. I'm biased. So what do you want from me? So I'm going to increase the saturation of the blues and I'm seeing some good mixtures everywhere. I want to make sure that I don't get any weird banding or artifacts where one color meets another. So for instance, if we zoom into her leg just a little bit, as this band here of blue begins to interact with the orange, that's potentially where we're going to find some purples and magentas, and those can get weird. You can just see these odd patterns and things that just don't make sense. So when you push the saturation a little too far, 
that can be the issue. So you just got to be careful with all of that. So right now I'm at plus 23 for the blues. I think that looks fine. Let's go ahead and increase the luminance values and see what's going on. Now her legs are getting way too bright. So her shins and legs are getting too bright with this. But if we look at that background, look up through here, as we push those blues, we are definitely getting more detail back there. So this is something that I do want to do. I want to push the luminance values of blue, but now I've made the decision I'm going to have to use a smart object, where essentially I'm going to take this raw file, do some processing to create one raw file smart object that I can take into Photoshop. Then I will duplicate it and bring that duplicate back into Adobe Camera Raw, make further changes, and then try to bring those together in Photoshop. All I'm really doing in layman's terms is I'm creating two or three different versions of the image that I can put together into Photoshop. Again, if you're new to Photoshop or to digital photo editing, this is no different than using adjustment brushes either in Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom. I just prefer to do it kind of old school style by using the layer system in Photoshop and not using the adjustment brushes. It's just a better control and workflow for me. I'm not gonna say one's better than the other, although I'm biased and I think layers are better, but that's my process. That's why I'm making that decision. So in this case, it doesn't matter if I increase the luminance all the way because I'm gonna keep it back here, but erase it off of this one. So let's just go ahead and increase it for right now uh, and see what's what. So let's start exploring some of the other tones now. So let's go to red and see what we have in it. So there is a lot of red again, in that mixture of that red orange, which was coming in on camera left. So I can take it down a little bit. If it's too red, I can shift the hue to get that more to the orange. And I think that's what I wanna do. So I'm shifting the hue of red right now to plus 13. Let's return the saturation. Actually, let's push the saturation just a bit. So the saturation is at plus 16, and I think that looks okay. And then increase the luminance just a little bit. Mm. I don't know. I, I think we don't really need any luminance pushes um, too much because again, this is that primary color that's hitting her. That's the part of her body that's closest to camera is this side of her body. And human beings, regardless of your ethnicity, you have the color orange, red, and yellow in your skin tone. So in this case, I don't think I needed to be that vibrant, but I do want those blues and those purples and magentas to potentially be a little bit stronger. So the red looks fine. Again, plus 13 for hue, plus 16 for saturation, and luminance is at plus three. Now let's go to the magenta. Yeah, magenta on her forehead and face around her legs and that was to be expected because again those mixtures of the blues and oranges and so forth are really going to come into play now i'm going to go ahead and decrease the saturation of the magenta just a little bit because again those odd colors when it comes to the mixtures of the two primary color tones that we've chosen which is blue and orange those are the ones that those odd colors they produce can get a little weird and wonky so by reducing the saturation just a little bit uh, we can stave off some of that potentially I'm increasing the luminance and I like what I see on her forehead, but on her legs and so forth, that's creating entirely too many problems. So let me go ahead and increase this just to kind of demonstrate what I'm talking about. This little band right through here, that weird artifact band, that's a part of the process of pushing that light too much. Now, sometimes that's unavoidable. If you have to problem solve your image and say, I need more light in these areas, you may have to just have that banding and then try to fix it in frequency separation. And it's relatively easy to fix, but in this case, I don't think it's necessary to push those pixels uh, that hard. So, or to push that color that hard, I should say. So I'm returning the luminance for magenta back to zero. We're at negative six for saturation. We can play with the hue of it, but really I don't think we need to. We can shift it a little bit closer to purple, but that again can introduce some of that weird banding. We're at negative seven right now for that hue shift, and I think that's okay. Let's go to purple, see how much purple is coming into play. Purple's big time in those areas as well. And I do love the color purple. Blue is my favorite color, purple's right behind it. So I do wanna try to push the values of purple in the scene just a little bit and see what we can get. So I'm bouncing it back and forth. I'm looking all around the scene. I definitely wanna push it pretty hard in the background. So I will do that on one of these smart object passes but let's pull it back just a little bit now to look at the legs. I'm specifically looking right here on her legs to make sure that we aren't getting too, too weird of a tone. So I think right about there, 
I'm not seeing too much odd banding. So I'm at a saturation point of plus 20 for purple, and the other two values of hue and luminance are staying at zero. So I think we're pretty good there. Let's go ahead and go to the cyan and just to see what we've got there. Not too much shift, it's just really in her leg. So uh, in her right shin, right down through here. So nothing too much uh, there to worry about. So that's good enough in the color mixer for this first pass, this first smart object that we're going to create. Now let's go to the basic tab. Let's remove the shadows and pull those out. Now we're getting a lot more detail back here in the background, which I really like. Then I'm gonna go ahead and increase the white point. The white point is my first go-to for luminance value increase in gel photography. I like to do it in normal lit photography as well. I do not like pushing the highlights. I like pushing the white point because you get a saturation of light and of color that has a great harmony together. Whereas highlights tend to blow the highlights very quickly and cause some of that weird wonky artifacts and so forth within the colors themselves. So I'm gonna take the highlights down just a little bit just to see what we're playing with. But I think honestly, they're okay being pushed just a little bit. So right now they're at plus five. The shadows are at plus 78 and the white point is at plus 19. I'm gonna increase the black point by taking it into the negatives. So right now we're at negative 15 and that is also my preference both with gels and with normal lit imagery is to push the black point instead of pushing contrast. Why? Well, let's return the black point to zero and take a look at her face. So let's zoom in just a little bit. If I increase the contrast, the colors immediately get really, really saturated to a point that it darkens them, it oversaturates them, it just pulls focus, it doesn't look good in my opinion. I've never been a fan of using the contrast slider in gel photography and I will use it in standard lit photography but only in dramatic lit portraiture. So. What I prefer to do again is to take the contrast out and then just add the black point. The black point's gonna give us that rich, dark tones in the luminance values, and we can compensate by taking the contrast out just a little bit. So the contrast is at negative 31 right now, and the black point is at negative 31. We're getting that good contrast, quote unquote, in the darker tones, but we're avoiding that color burn, so to speak, or oversaturation by using the contrast slider itself. So at this point, uh, I'm not gonna worry about texture clarity and dehaze. That's the, you know, the third part of that fundamental of color luminosity and detail. Not gonna worry about that right now. We'll worry about that at the end when we're finalizing everything. I can go ahead and push the saturation just a little bit globally and we can push the vibrance just a touch globally, but not a big change there because we already took care of that under the color mixer. So. Find a little bit that I want to point out since you're downloading this image. This is a raw file. Make sure that you're opening it as a 16-bit image. If you click this link down here, it may say different things for you, but click the link. It's going to bring up the camera raw preferences. This is the color space that I'm choosing to work in, which is Adobe RGB 1998. The second most popular is Pro Photo RGB. I would suggest being in either one of those and not in sRGB. This is the color space for the web, and it is incredibly limiting with color. I want you to be in 16 bits per channel. By default, Photoshop is always in eight bits. Be in 16 bits because 16 bits allows for so much more color to be into the image itself. Once you change it to 16 bits and hit okay, that'll be the last time you have to do that here in ACR. So to open this as a smart object directly, what I need to do is to hold the shift key and down here where it says open, when I hold the shift key, it says open object. I'm gonna click that. It'll take us into Photoshop proper. And then I'm going to right click anywhere where there's not a word or a picture and that'll bring up a new menu so i can come down to new smart object via copy that's making a duplicate of this that is not connected to it or linked to it so that when i make changes to this top duplicate it will not affect the bottom one so to take this duplicate back into adobe camera raw all i have to do is click on the double click on the thumbnail twice and it will reopen ACR and keep all of the sliders exactly where they were when we opened it the first time. I should also mention, I probably should have put this at the beginning, that if you want to skip ahead and you know some of this stuff, uh, just there's the time codes at the bottom of the window thingy so you can skip ahead uh, if you'd like. So with this one, all I need to do is come back to the color mixer. Let's go to that blue section and bring the luminance down big time. I'm ignoring the background because I'm looking at her legs now to make sure that her legs look pretty decent with the blues. Let's go ahead and increase that saturation just a little bit and maybe bring that luminance back up just a touch. Eh, no, I think right about there at 18, I'm gonna pull the highlights down because I don't want the audience's focus to be pulled 
down to her legs down here. I, of course, want the audience to go to her face first, but this is a very bright section of the image because that full spectrum unit from Luminate was really close to her legs in this shot. So again, audiences are prone to take their focus point to the brightest source within the image, which in this case might have been her legs. So that's why I'm trying to battle that by pulling the highlights down. Let's pull the white point down just a little bit too. I want that up lighting that was presented by the unit, but it doesn't need to be that strong. So those changes I think are fine. I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay. It's gonna prepare the smart object. Now, since it's at the top of the layer stack, this is the version of the image that I see open in this system or open in our document. What I need to do is to put a black mask onto this or a hide all mask. So to do that, I'm gonna come down to the bottom of the layers window and hold the alter option key and click the layer mask icon that makes that black mask. Now everything is hidden from this layer. So therefore we can see the bottom layer here in our document. So we see all the brightness has been returned. Now I'm gonna click the layer mask and start painting on this mask, making sure that my foreground color is set to white. I'm gonna change the flow of my brush to 10%, but keep the opacity at 100%. This enables me to do a slow buildup so I can strategically bring in this top smart object and all those changes that we made. I'm using a Wacom Intos Pro tablet. I strongly, strongly, highly, Strongly, highly, strongly recommend that you use a pen tablet with all of your digital photo editing. I know it takes time with a learning curve to get used to using this pen, but we are programmed to hold pens and writing instruments all the time. It's pressure sensitivity. There's pressure sensitivity built into the tablet and into the pen. So the lighter you interact the pen to the tablet, the lighter the tools are gonna to interact in Photoshop. I strongly recommend that you take the time to get that, go through the learning curve because it will vastly improve your artwork. So in this case, again, making sure that the layer mask is selected, I'm just gonna start painting white onto the section down here over her legs to start revealing that top smart object and bring in that less light and neutrality. Let me make sure that I'm on the right brush and I'm not, there we go. I just wanna be on a soft round brush. One of the default brushes will do for the Photoshops. And I'm just bringing down some of these light values down through here so they don't potentially pull focus too much. Now I'm gonna hit the letter X to switch my foreground color from white to black. And that's the hotkey to do that by the way. And I'm just gonna give it just a little bit more boost of light. What I like to do is to take it all the way to what I prepared the file to be, which was essentially making sure that the entire section down there was filled with white and then back it down just a little bit because subtlety is key inside of Photoshop. I say that all the time in all the different videos. The more subtle you are with all the changes you do in the imagery, then they build a better cohesive look to the image rather than one big, bright, bold thing you've done to the image that may pull the audience's focus. So in this case, I think that looks pretty good. Let's maybe give it one more little gesture and then reverse it and go back. Here we go, just little touches like this. I'm looking at some of the contouring of her legs and in a way I'm kind of dodging and burning, so to speak, by returning some of the original brightness values on that key contouring of her legs so it will play up her anatomy and her body. This is a sensual image. It's okay to pull some of that into focus. So let's go ahead and just touch it a little bit more right through there just to bring some of those little values back, but I think that looks pretty good. And then I'm gonna go ahead and turn this off just so we can see the before and after and see how powerful that is right now. That's just too bright and that could pull the audience's focus straight down to the bottom of the image. They need to go to her face. So those two raw uh, smart objects, that's it. They look good. I think everything is fine as far as the colors mixing together and that first processing of the raw file looks good. So I'm gonna go ahead and flatten this, which means I'm working destructively. I'm gonna come up to layer come down to flatten image. Now both of these will be compressed down into one layer and they are no longer smart objects, which means they are no longer raw files. I can go back to Adobe Camera Raw as a filter with this layer, but I cannot go back as a raw file and see all those sliders with the numbers that we had adjusted them to before we open them into the Photoshop. So once it's been converted, that's the end of the road for the raw file. Now it's time to begin working with the image itself. So before we go into the retouch, and I'm gonna be using my retouch 4.0 action, um, I want to do just a little bit of liquefying to the image in any key areas that we need to. And before I do that, I wanna kinda of give a brief disclaimer. I use liquefy on images very strategically, very minimally, and I do it to the expectations of my clients. I do not prefer to use 
the liquify tool to make breasts incredibly large, to make tummies incredibly skinny, and to do all that kind of stuff. And when I have a client or a subject on a model who requests that, I have a very strong discussion with them about it because I want them to understand that I know that that's what they may want. But anybody who sees that image, they're going to know the difference. And that's just my personal standpoint. I don't want to push that upon anybody else, but I will share my standpoint with you. Using the liquify tool to move small little bits of the body and to kind of move bits of clothing and so forth to make more pleasing curves and flowing lines i think that's okay and to do certain things like potentially moving the nose bone down if the nose bone is a little bit prominent in the image based upon the positioning of the nose and so forth we can do things like that so looking at this image i do know it surely does not have a big nose at all or anything like that at all she's she's in truly incredible and beautiful and and there's nothing wrong with her nose but this positioning of it and the way the light's hitting it we can see that her nose bone is just protruding out just a little bit because of that highlight and shadow and the position so that's where i'm going to use liquify to kind of push that in so i'm hitting control shift and the letter x or command shift and the letter x if you're on a mac now in the liquify section i like to use the forward warp tool my size and the density of it doesn't really matter it's the pressure i keep the pressure at 10 because I want it to be a very gradual process that I do. I don't want it to be a quick one. Now I'm zooming in just a little bit more, but things are rendering just a touch slow there. And then I'm gonna use the left and right bracket keys to make the brush bigger or smaller. And this is a case where I will use my traditional mouse for my computer and not the pen, because the traditional mouse gives just a little bit more control. And all I'm doing is pushing just that much just that little tip right there. Now, is that a massive major difference? Is it going to make or break this image? No, not at all. And if I left it, I highly doubt that Shirley would care. But the point is, it's little things like that that you can do that build some trust with your clients when you're working with them so that they know that you want to preserve their look and integrity as much as possible, but to you know flatter them a little bit as well if that's something that they want. Just make sure you have that dialogue with them and that discussion before you make any major changes to their body in post-production. So I'm gonna to come to her elbow here and just minimize that just a little bit. Again, that's kind of one of the typical beauty standards that we look for when you're editing a female. You wanna look for things like knees and elbows and joints in the hands and so forth so that if any of them are a little too strong, uh, anything is standing out a little too much, then you can always adjust all of that. Now, there's a few flyers up here in her hair. I'm just gonna push those in just a little bit. It's a minor thing, but since we're in the liquefied tool, we can go ahead and take care of that. The rest of everything else looks fine. Her hips, her legs, that all looks good. So I'm gonna hit Control or Command the number zero to zoom all the way back out and take one final look, but I think we're good. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit OK. Now we can go into the retouching part of this. So I'm gonna go ahead and run the Retouch 4.0 action. This is very similar to the Retouch 3.0 action that is available for free on the channel. There's a video in the retouching series that will take you to the Google Drive where you can download that action. Um, I use the media noise version of creating frequency separation layers and I do not use the Gaussian blur method any longer. And continuing all of this, uh, I will get all these layers put together. I am intending on making a video for you that will provide the Retouch 4.0 action to you. Um, I just haven't yet, because if you haven't seen some of the previous videos on the channel, namely the uh, Artist Heal Thyself personal vlog, we had a baby on May. My wife had a baby on May 1, and uh, he is a wonderful little nugget, but uh, life has been a little bit upside down since then. So bear with me because I've been covered in baby puke and other things that I can't tell you about because it's gross. Anyway, so all the layers have been put together now for frequency separation. We're going to start on the detail layer using the clone stamp tool. And the clone stamp tool is the preferred tool to use to get rid of any detail in the image that we need to remove like blemishes, lines, things of that nature. Now, typically, on a standard image that's uh, standard lit without the gels, I would leave this helper layer on that is a black and white adjustment layer. So it forces your eyes to see white, black, and gray. It makes it easier to see any kind of blemishes or distractions on that detail layer. But I recommend not leaving it on when you're doing gel glamour because as you're borrowing detail from one area and one field of color and you copy it to somewhere else, some of that color property can come with it. 
The detail layer is not devoid of color. There is color there. So I do strongly recommend that you don't necessarily use that helper layer if you can avoid it. Now, I'm just trying to smooth out any textures that stand out just a little bit. Shirley's got great skin, so it doesn't really matter too much, but any of the areas where some of the glycerin that we were using on her body so that it would catch some of the highlights from the lighting or any kind of blemish or so forth, any pores and texture in her skin that stands out more than the rest because of those elements, I just wanna smooth all of that out. Again, I'm using the clone stamp tool, making my target selection of the zone that I want to copy and then just bringing that into play. Now, a lot of this texture in the skin is soft everywhere because I was using that 85 millimeter 1.4 prime. So focusing on her eyes, once we hit there, we're gonna see a lot of fall off of detail everywhere else. I'm gonna go ahead and minimize some of these lines that we see on the forehead because again, this is one of those standard kind of things that we look for in beauty retouches with women to go ahead and take care of the lines that just naturally happens because they're wearing makeup and uh, those will show up. They're there, so we can go ahead and minimize some of that at this step. And again, preserving the integrity of the image and so forth is one thing, but you have to ask yourself the question like, do I really need to preserve all of the skin texture in great detail on her forehead? Is that where people need to be looking in a gelled glamour image? And I'm trying not to be crass here, but we want them to look at her eyes and her face and potentially take in other parts of her body, but we, you know, not necessarily have people go, mm, look at that forehead. Oh, delicious. No, it's not necessary. So in this case, I don't mind sacrificing some of that detail there by using the clone stamp tool on other areas of the face where the detail is just a little bit softer. And I'm technically copying some of the detail from the orange side into the blue side, but it's not bringing a lot of texture with, or I'm sorry, color detail with it. So I think we're okay. Again, smoothing out some of that detail on her nose because it's just not necessary to have that strong skin texture into those areas. Let's go onto this side of her face too and under her left eye socket, just smooth out some of that texture across the board. So that looks pretty good. We could travel around the rest of the image and look for any other areas that we may want to retouch. I leave that up to you. For purposes of the video on here on YouTube, I want to try to keep this as short as I can. So I do encourage you to look around the rest of the images. If you see any other marks or any things that you want to change, then go right ahead. But I want to move into the next step, which is to use the mixer brush on the color layer itself. This is the more impactful step of the frequency separation retouch, because this is one that not only produces the quote unquote smooth skin look, but especially in gels. This is where you can get a lot of fun as an artist to go in and start really smoothing some colors together, smoothing those transitions of colors together and see what smooth, beautiful, colorful results we can get. So I'm gonna use my mixer brush, my settings for my mixer brush. Wet is set to 30%, load is set to 30%, mix is set to 30%, and flow is set to 10%. Make sure this icon is checked, which means to clean the brush after each stroke, so that every time I touch my pen to the tablet, it's going to sample the color that it sees and use that to start mixing it with the other colors. So I'm gonna start here, and I'm just moving back and forth. I have two different brush strokes that I commonly use with the mixer brush. One is to simply just move the brush back and forth to gently just start blending all the little colors together. Another is to make broader strokes where I will try to move like, let's say this color up to another area. So I will make a, I'm making contact and then I will push the color up and let go. Make contact and push the color up and let go. I'm gonna go to back two steps in my history because I didn't really want to do that. I just want to demonstrate it to you. So I'm probably just going to use that first brush stroke through all of this, which again is just smoothing all those colors together by mixing them. This is also where if we get any of that weird banding of those magentas and purples, we can take care of that generally and usually at this step. So all of the wrinkles that we saw on her forehead, there's highlight and shadow there that delineates that curve of her skin. So we can use the mixer brush at this stage to smooth a lot of that out and it gives the illusion that there was no wrinkle there to begin with. So that's why I said a moment ago that using the mixer brush at this stage is a very powerful step 
in the retouch, whether it be gel glamour or not, because by simply mixing colors together, we are changing the overall three-dimensional nature of certain sections of the image. So again, instead of trying to think about it, like I've got to retouch all those wrinkles, you don't have to, you can mix the colors. And when you start mixing different colors, you start getting some great results. I went back to the clone stamp tool and the detail layer, because as I've zoomed in, I can see some weird banding and the magentas from the details and so just copying a new detail and copying over those weird bands and weird little artifacts we can get rid of all of that and make things flow just a little bit more smoothly so let's go back to the mixer brush and the main color layer and again i'm on the main color layer i'm not on the layer mask that's tied with it and i'm using that mixer brush again at all the areas where colors meet up and there's travel from one color to another we're just smoothing it all together this is a stage that you can go as far as you wish to go with your own creativity, but I recommend just trying to first think about smoothing out those transitions between one field of color to another. Don't think about trying to completely replace all the colors or digitally paint quite yet. That's definitely one of the fun things you can do with frequency separation and the mixer brush. But in this case, it's something that uh, for the purposes of this video, for the learning, uh, I would pr prefer you don't do that. So now that I'm zoomed in again, let's zoom in just a little bit more so you can see what I'm talking about. I'm returning to the detail layer and right through here, there's this weird banding edge of pixels that are very pixelated that is the edge perimeter of that magenta when it meets orange. This is a detail issue that if I use the clone stamp tool, grab some soft detail and just clone over those edges of detail, it smooths out those artifacts. It leaves those little hints of magenta and purple, which is fine. I want them to be there. I want that interest in the color. I just don't want those bizarre artifacts that happens because the colors are getting pushed a little too much in the Adobe Camera Raw process or in the um, process of frequency separation. So. Smoothing out some of those little transitions just a little bit. Go. I think that looks pretty good. Maybe that one right there. Just a couple of those little highlights of her skin texture up top. So, looks good to me. Looks pretty smooth on the face. Um, let's just do a quick before and after so we can see how working with the color layer is so strong in the retouch. So, this is before and after. Before and after. Zoom in a little bit more. Before and after, for after. So we can, of course, do the rest of the body and I leave that up to you. I do wanna come down to the legs real quick though and uh, just briefly hit those because I want you to see what I would do to make these choices here to get us going. So again, that same mixing brush stroke that I've done before, I'm just trying to mix these little transitions of colors, but I'm also trying to follow the flow of it. So notice I'm following this white flow through here that we brought in with that one smart object. Instead of just making my brush really big so that it would cover the entire area there, I'm making it small and working within the confines of that blue. I'm feathering it up and just mixing it together with everything else that we see in her leg so that it becomes smooth trying to do the same thing through here so that if there's any mottling in the skin, the three-dimensional nature of the skin, think about it like topography, like map topography. If there is little small rises and falls within the skin, we're gonna see some color variation, especially in gels, and that is something we can smooth out in this step. So looking elsewhere, I think everything else is fine for the most part, looks fine, chest, everything else is fine, so we're good through there. So let's move on to dodging and burning. Coming up into the next folder group here, turning it on and activating it. Now again, in this folder group, I have a black and white adjustment layer that's that helper layer because dodging and burning is all about creating artificial highlight and shadow by using luminosity to do that to sculpt the 3D nature of the image. So in this case, seeing white, black, and gray is not the end of the world. We don't need to see the colors necessarily. So I always prefer to start with the burn. I'm gonna hit B for brush, make sure my flow is set to 10% and I'm gonna be painting white onto the layer mask. Make sure that I'm still on the right brush. Good, there we go. And I'm just gonna start painting white onto this uh, dodge curve to start adding some shadows where I see it within the scene. So anywhere where there's just a little bit of a darker tone of gray and so forth, I'm gonna add some shadows to that. 
Now, some of these I might take away once I turn off the black and white adjustment helper layer. But for right now, I don't want to make like critical decisions about every one of these little brush strokes. I just want to get it down. I want to paint it and then evaluate. I'm adding some more burning to the cheeks into that contouring there because that's typically what you would do, especially along the jawline. We're adding a shadow there. We're going to add a corresponding highlight that creates a sense of three dimension and lets those elements of her face stand out just a little bit more. So like here where her collarbones are meeting her shoulder, we can add a little bit of highlight there where we see some cleavage. We can add some more shadows down through there to help that stand out because again, this is a sensual image. I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit, add some shadows to the armpit there because again, we have to ask the question, do we want people to be necessarily looking at her armpit in the scene? And chances are, no, we don't want them to. So now I'm going to come down to the dodge and pretty much repeat the same thing, looking at key areas where I painted shadows just a moment ago and just start adding in a little bit of highlight in certain key areas now to match that corresponding shadow so that we can let things stand out a little bit more in that sense of three dimension. Down here on the collarbone a little bit, up on the shoulder, top of the breast so they stand out a little bit more and then maybe the hot spots on her uh, shoulder socket, her hand, and maybe just a couple little brushes down her arm. Now we can look at those same areas in the leg and just give those a little touch and push some of the light values through there. Then one of my favorite things to add dodging and burning to is hair. So just coming up here and hitting these areas that are a little bit brighter in the hair will help those stand out. Controller command the number zero to zoom all the way back out. I'm gonna turn off the helper layer so that I can get a view of everything and then doing a quick before and after by turning off the entire folder group itself by clicking this little icon right here. So before and after, before and after. So the three dimensional nature of her face is standing out even more. Beautiful cheekbones are standing out. It looks great. Her legs look smooth, her arms, her chest, it all looks great. I think it's beautiful. Now I'm gonna to come to the color highlights curves adjustment layer here in the Dodge and Burn folder group. This one is one of my favorites to use in gel glamour imagery and i'm going to specifically use it on the background first and look at the effect of what it does so as i start painting white onto it because of the blending mode that this is on and the specific control points of the curves adjustment layer itself we're getting a lot of rich saturated light and color into those tones and i absolutely love using this curves adjustment layer to do that so now hitting some of these key areas in her face and on areas like her lips and so forth where I may want some of that to stand out. Mm, I don't like what it looks like on her lips. It looks kind of fake, like she's got some weird like lip smack or lip gloss or some crap on there. So I just don't like that at all. Um, let's go ahead and hit her shoulders up here. As I zoom into her shoulder, I can see that really strong banding through here. <clears throat> excuse me, of going from magenta to orange. So in this case, this is something where we would want to return to the color layer and then use the mixer brush to kind of smooth this transition out of color and then potentially clone in some new detail if we need to, to get rid of that banding. That's something I will leave up to you as you continue to work with the image. But again, for purposes of the video, trying to keep it short or as short as I can, uh, I'm not gonna go that far with it. So back to that color highlights area, just hit a few of these. Uh, I want to change the flow of my brush to 5% because I want some of these just to be minimal now that I hit almost like little hot spots of light and I don't want them to be as strong as we saw just a moment ago where I had to take it off of her lips. So I think that looks pretty good. I'm gonna to come to the color burn curves adjustment layer, do the same thing again. I'm gonna look for some areas just like burning itself where I can add just a little bit more interest in the colors and get them a little bit darker, maybe the bottom of the lip, bottom of the nose, tip of the nose, some of these areas through here and her eyes, maybe her center sternum, and then up in the hair just a little bit. This is technically making the colors a little bit darker, but not truly from a strong luminosity perspective, luminosity, luminosity perspective, but from a perspective of uh, color. So I think that made sense. I'm stuck on saying the word luminosity. I don't know, sometimes my Western accent just comes out for no reason. So anyway, I think that's enough for the color burn in there. Again, that quick before and after. Look how much of a difference that cur uh, color highlights curves adjustment layer makes in that background. It's just, it's pretty slick. So now let's go on to the final section here, which is her eyes. And we'll start with the whites of her eyes. This is definitely where subtlety is key inside of Photoshop. I'm gonna change the flow of my brush to 
painting white onto the mask to reveal it. Now I'm making her have nuclear white eyes. This is not where I want to leave it. Subtlety is key. So now with the layer active, I'm going to come up to opacity and just reduce the opacity down to like 39%. I generally start somewhere below 40% and then take an evaluation by zooming all the way back out uh, of the image by hitting control or command and the number zero before and after. It's just a minor little boost to the whites of the eyes. I think that looks pretty good. Now let's go to the next here, which is number two, Iris Light Boost. A for brush, again, painting with 100% flow and opacity, painting white onto the black layer mask to reveal those effects. Then going to the next one, which is an optional extra light boost. So I wanna add some more in there since her eyes are a little too dark because the uh, full spectrum wasn't throwing a lot of light into her eyes. Now the fourth one, or I'm sorry, the third one here is color boost. When I hit this one, um, you're going to see a pretty strong result of color. And that's because we want her to look like a sexy vampire. No, it's because if I double click on this hue saturation adjustment layer icon, it brings it up in the properties window. The saturation is set to 50 plus 50 by default for the action. I'm going to reduce it down to like 35. I don't need her eyes to be that rich into color. I just want to be able to see them. So they're there and everything else looks good. We do not need the optional color vibrance boost, nor do we need to do the iris ring darkening because that outer ring is pretty dark as it is already. So I think we're good with frequency separation, dodging and burning and enhancing the eyes. Again, I encourage you to go through the rest of the image using the mixer brush, the clone stamp tool and so forth, and just go into those areas that you want to see some of that cool effect uh, and work on those retouching techniques. But at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and flatten everything again. So we're now condensed down working destructively. And what I wanna do is to get rid of this little bit that we can see of one of the full spectrum units. So I'm gonna to come to this little icon of the lock and click it to unlock the layer, then hit V for the move tool. I wanna to make sure that on the move tool, this is checked, this says show transform controls. So we can see the transform controls all the way around the image. Now holding alter option, actually forget that, just grab the corner and just resize it by pulling it up just a little bit to get rid of that. Then I'm gonna come down here and pull the bottom just to make sure that all of the data goes off of the edges of the entire image so that we don't have a weird blank white line on one of those edges. Once I've resized it, I'm flattening it again so it's returning it back to a normal locked background layer. And this is where we can continue forward now with the color grade and finishing up the image itself. So. A lot of different things that we can do. Color grading in this case may seem counterproductive because why would you want to color grade it when it's so full of color? And that's one of the things that I typically try to avoid when I'm doing gel imagery. I don't necessarily want to throw extra colors into it, but it's worth exploring. So in this case, I'm gonna to come to some of my favorite options, which is to use a solid color adjustment layer. Let's pick a color of orange that we know is pretty rich. And let's change some of the blending modes and see what we get. Darken. Nope, nope, arrowing down through these, darker color doesn't look good. Lighten is one that I typically go for. So let's go ahead and reduce the opacity of lighten and just see what we're getting. So we're really giving more of that orange tone into all of this, which is kind of interesting and looks good. So let's go ahead and do a second solid color adjustment layer, but this time let's do it for one of those rich blues and see what we have in the scene. So I'm gonna bring it down closer to that teal right about there. And let's, let's bump it up. Let's just make it a little bit more saturated. Uh, maybe about there. Okay, good. And now let's take this one to lighten, reduce the opacity significantly like we did the other and before and after, before and after and the original image. So these two are working together to not only lighten the shadows, it's giving it a little bit of that matte effect to the image, which I personally don't mind. I used to really like that, but I've been trying to get away from that style in 2020 and 2021, and I'm not doing very good at getting away from it because I really, really like the matte effect. But there's some interesting things that we can do to see what we can bring back into this. So what I wanna do now is at the top of the layer stack, I'm going to make a brightness and contrast adjustment layer. This is one of those times where we could explore the contrast and see if that's going to help us get some of that tone back into the black point without completely sacrificing the matte effect that just happened with these two solid color adjustment layers. So pushing that contrast just a little bit, pushing the brightness maybe just a touch and seeing again, this is where we started and let's sequentially put these back in. Yeah, I think it's, it's 
kind of interesting. I, I like the overall effect to it. And I think that looks good. Uh, I apparently just discovered a treasure in The Legend of Zelda that's actually my phone telling me I have a text message. Apologize, I was supposed to put that on Do Not Disturb. So I think that looks pretty good at this standpoint, but let's go ahead and put all of these together in a group and turn it off because I wanna explore other options. That's the whole fun of the shop vlog where we explore different ways of doing things so that you can learn and work alongside. So let's go into the selective color adjustment layer. This is one that is my absolute favorite to use. And this is one again, where we can start changing some values to see what we can push. Now, instead of coming to the colors themselves, like we did with the color mixer in Adobe Camera Raw, I'm gonna come down to the last three, which is whites, neutrals, and blacks, because those are luminosity values that we can actually add color to them. So in this case, let's start with the white point within the image and start adding some colors and see if it shows up very much, uh, if at all. It typically doesn't with the white option, in the selective color adjustment layer, but it will definitely show up in the neutrals and the blacks. So I'm gonna go ahead with the neutrals just to give you an idea. If I move this to the right, we're adding more yellow. If I take it to the left, we're adding more blue into the neutral values that we see, which is kind of the mid-tones. So I'm gonna add just a little bit more yellow into the scene. Maybe add in just a little bit, no, not green. Let's go into those magentas. And let's go ahead and take some cyan into the mix. There we go. And now let's go to the black point and start adding some deep blues into that and see what we get. So adding in, I'm sorry, adding in blues into those backgrounds. And then let's add some of that green to balance it and maybe just a touch of cyan. Mm. Yeah, cyan. So in the black point, in the shadows, I'm adding essentially the blue family. And in the neutral tones, the mid-tones, if you will, I'm adding some of those yellows back into the scene. We're dealing with orange and blue. So I'm using the two luminosity values where I know it'll show up the most to add those colors into it. Running off the same color palette that I used with the full spectrum units from Luminate. So I'm not adding other tones into it to try to change the color palette. I'm supplementing it by looking at the luminosity values in this scene. The background has a lot of darker tones in it. So I chose to add the blues there. Her body has the brighter tones in it, so those mid-tone neutral values is where we're going to see all of that by adding some of those yellows and oranges and putting that back into play. So that one adjustment layer can get us pretty far into this with an interesting little bit of an effect. If we turn on that top layer again, we're building up even more effects, although I don't really like the matte look at all, and I'm it's weird. I loved it, but now I don't like it. I like this. And this is giving you a glimpse of my process as an artist. I, I don't mean this to sound, you know, boasting and arrogant, but like I know a lot of different ways of doing things in Photoshop. And so when I sit down and I'm editing, part of the joy and fun of creation is to go, oh, let's try a different method. Let's try something else and see what this looks like versus that and so forth. So in this case, this one selective color adjustment layer, I'm actually pretty much digging what that does for us. So I think we're good there. I'm going to delete that first set of stuff because just because you can doesn't mean you should. Ian Malcolm from Jurassic Park, right? We don't have to do a whole bunch of, you know, LUTs and look at uh, uh, selective color adjustment layers and third-party programs and just compound and compound and compound. Sometimes simple is good enough. It's about the story and the impact. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with adding five or six different adjustment methods to work with color, but sometimes just let the neutrality of the scene, I'm sorry, let the impact of the scene let the colors of the scene be as they are and let your retouch and your color grade be the neutrality that you're just adding little finesse moments to the entire piece itself. So I think that looks pretty good the way it is. I'm fine with it. Uh, I wanna move on to adding some sharpness and some detail to all of this. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a composite layer of everything by hitting Control, Alt, Shift, and the letter E for everything, or Command, Option, Shift, and E on a Mac. That essentially combined these two so I don't have to flatten them, so that if I do wanna go back, I can. But with this new layer active, I'm going to do a high pass filter. It's one of the easiest ways to add texture to this image, to add sharpness to it. There's many other ways like Smart Sharpen, the Unsharp Mask and all that kind of stuff. I like doing it this way. So I'm gonna come up to Filter, then down to Other, and then to High Pass. Now, the higher of the radius I set this, the more pixelated, the more sharp it's going to be, but that can also make it look very grainy, very HDR, and could be very affecting to the image. So I'm gonna start at a lower high pass of like, let's say five pixels, and then hit okay. 
Now I have to change the blending mode of this layer to something that will let it interact with the other layers below. When you do this method of high pass to sharpen an image, you're going to be looking at the family of overlay all the way down to like linear light. Linear light is the strongest effect of the detail that you can see. Soft light is the softest effect of it. I generally like to do hard light. It's a good mix of getting that detail into the scene, but it's not too strong into that HDR kind of feeling. So as you can see, we don't have any kind of major halos or anything. I think it looks pretty fine from that perspective. Uh, so we've gotten some detail and some sharpness back into this. We've done some color work with it. Now let's do one final thing to this. Again, with those principles and fundamentals of Photoshop, color, luminosity, and detail. Let's look about light. So with light, and especially with gels, I want to use a third party program that I absolutely love and adore. I've explored it on the channel in previous videos, and that is Oniric by Composite Nation. So I'm going to go ahead and bring that into the screen here so we can see it. I'm going to go ahead and click generate, and that will take us into the Oniric dialog. Now, if you've never seen Oniric, it's a way to create non destructive glare. Uh, glows and flares into images. It's a wonderful intuitive program. It does take some time with the renderer to get everything set up and to be able to prepare the file for you to use the interface. So don't get discouraged as it works because it can take just a little bit of time. So here in the interface, the first thing we need to do is to click the X-ray button to see what Oniric sees. Anything in green are the strongest luminosity values it sees in the scene. As I increase the threshold here, it's at a default of 0.25. It will go all the way up to one. As I increase this, and then let go of the slider, it reevaluates and you'll see more in green. Now, when I turn off X ray, we'll start to see the glowing effect already taking place. So I'm going to go ahead and increase the threshold even further to go to like plus 75. We're getting some really good glow now into the scene, and I really dig it the way it is. But it's at a radius of 20, which means it's expanded outward with the glow a lot. I like to reduce this radius and take it down sometimes by half. So I'm taking it down to like 10.8 here. It's gonna decrease the overall glow to make those glows more close to the light source itself and will give that overall effect, making it feel like her skin is really, you know, glowing in that ethereal beauty kind of way. Now we can reduce the intensity if it's too powerful. We can also use the mask system that is built into Oniric to be able to strategically take it away from certain key areas. But generally I can get away with minimizing some of the powerful effect of it by just simply bringing down the intensity. And in this case, by reducing the radius and the intensity, I love this soft, beautiful, ethereal glow that we see I think it looks good enough I'm going to add just a little bit of light dispersion where essentially we're going to get an RGB split where we can see that typical effect that you would see live physically with light if it was being refracted through something you would see that dispersion so look right here at her shoulder let me return the light dispersion to zero see how it bounces back but now if I take the light dispersion let's take it up to a big number like 10 you can see the RGB split everywhere where Oniric sees the light. So in this case, we're getting a little bit of that psychedelic funky kind of feeling. I like that. I don't want it to go potentially too far. I think uh, light dispersion of 10 is too high. So I'm going to bring it back down to maybe four. Four is generally good enough to give us just a little bit of that funky kind of feeling, but not too much. So at this point, this is all I want to do with Oniric. I like the glow that I see. Everything looks good. So all I have to do now is hit save. It's going to generate the actual entire effect and then take us back into Photoshop when it's done. And then we'll see a new smart object at the top of the layer stack that has the effect of Oniric and all the glows. And we can turn it on and off here. We can use a layer mask to take it away from certain key areas if we need to, but ultimately I think it looks good just the way it is. So the final step that I want to do for this piece is I'm going to make yet again another composite layer of everything by hitting Control, Alt, Shift, and the letter E for everything, or Command, Option, Shift, and E on a Mac, so I have that topmost layer. Now let's take that into Adobe Camera Raw as a filter by hitting Control, Shift, and A, or Command, Shift, and A on a Mac. And this is where I'd like to do just a little bit of fine tuning and tweaking to pull the image to its final state of art. So I'm gonna pull the black point down again just to get some more saturation in there. Maybe pull the highlights down just a touch. 
Let's increase that white point again, pull out some of those shadows, just a little bit more in those details. Maybe give us a little bit more texture. Texture is a wonderful way to get detail into the scene uh, besides the high pass filter. And maybe push the clarity just a little bit. So those little touches I think are fine. We're addressing some of those detail aspects of color, luminosity, and detail. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay. And then the last step, if you've seen any of my videos on the channel, if you're new, welcome. Make sure to look at all the other videos on this channel because there's a lot to explore. I love using vignettes as a final method to be able to drive the audience's focus to the subject. So my favorite way to make a vignette is to make a solid color adjustment layer at the top of the layer stack. Make sure that I'm using pure black, so RGB is set to zero. Hit OK, and then change the blending mode here to soft light. And that will give us that darker tone and then on the layer mask itself, I'm going to use the gradient tool and I'm specifically going to use the radial gradient. I wanna make sure that I'm set to a gradient option of this one in the middle that is your foreground color to transparency. Now in this case, my foreground color right now is white. I need it to be black, why? Because I'm gonna be painting black onto this mask to hide the effect of the vignette where I want the full light to be seen in the scene using this radial gradient at an opacity of 30%. So layer mask is selected. I'm gonna start hitting the gradients and just pulling this line gently out, which is making small little circles of black paint onto that white mask, which is revealing the original luminosity values of everything below. And that's letting me just create these strategic little areas where the audience can look and see and take in this scene. And with that, that's it. Simple process of retouching, of looking at colors and details with those fundamentals of Photoshop and pulling it all together to create a soft, beautiful, ethereal glow and image. So let's finish off this tutorial today with some final thoughts. The biggest takeaway that I want you to have from this is that when you work with gel glamour images, there's so much you can do with that color. When you work with gel lighting in general, I shouldn't say just glamour, there's so much you can do with the color and so many ways to explore tweaking it and, and altering it and augmenting it to be able to add to that story and to add to your overall artwork itself. So take the time to explore different options of color grading, different options of manipulating color and see the results. Even go through the process of, again, I use blue and orange as the color palette in that image. Change it completely, change it to other tones and see what you like. Start shifting the hues because it's something you can do and make up an entire new image all from the comforts of the photoshops that's the end of this video today if you like the content you found in it make sure to give the video a like and consider subscribing to the channel because new content debuts each week in photography and photoshop education and when you subscribe make sure to hit the bell icon to be notified of that new content when you return to the youtubes thanks for watching today and until next time i'll see you out there in the world of photoshop